is in ourselves, we all possess a dream, which lay dormant, until intrigue strikes its match, and sets the torch we carry ablaze, leading us down the path of the unknown towards our dreams. As coaches, who are former high-performance athletes, our personal experiences have shown us that a coach, parent, or even a fellow athlete have the potential to either illuminate or extinguish the dreams of young athletes. Nothing is lost from the candle which lights another. We are here to share our stories and our passion to illuminate the champion within, empowering coaches, parents, and athletes to keep the flame of their dreams burning eternally. You are listening to Illuminating Champions with Michal and Ashley Anton. Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Illuminating Champions. My name is Ashley, and I'm here with my husband, Mihail. Hey, how are you guys? And in today's episode, we'd like to take a moment to celebrate all of who we consider to be some of the most special people in the world. And that is people who take time out of their everyday lives to teach other people, to coach other people in all different capacities. And we thought, what better way to start than with someone who's so special to us, our very own coach and mentor, Mark Patterson. So we'd like to introduce you to Mark. We know that for those of you who have been listening along to episodes one and two, you've seen Mark a little bit here and there, helping us share our story by interviewing us. And we'd like to start off today by interviewing him so you can all learn why he's so special to us and hear his perspectives on his life as a coach and as a mentor and what's so important to him. So a very warm welcome to Mr. Mark Patterson. Hi, Mark. Hi, thanks for having me. (laughs) You're welcome. How are you today? I'm doing great. Great. So as we told our listeners in the first two episodes, you have a company called The Brand Artist, and we truly feel that you are our brand artist, so we love the name. But (laughs) prior to launching this brand artist company that you have, can you tell us a little bit about what it was you were doing before? Sure. Well, I've always been an artist. I was a fine artist, painter. I was the art kid in my high school. The high school gave me the first art award as a surprise because I, I just did art. I drew and painted. I wasn't very good, but I it was my passion. I went to design school, University of Cincinnati, which happens to be a great design school because Procter & Gamble and a lot of head, world headquarters were there, so it attracted great designers from all over the world. So got good training. After that, I went to Indianapolis and worked in a design firm, a very small boutique, but very high end, did annual reports, pharmaceutical work, and that was great. And then after about five years, I started my own business with a really cool guy, a World War II vet, Navy hero. He was at D-Day Normandy, D-Day Iwo Jima, D-Day Okinawa. He was such an intellectual pacifist from his life experience that he and I had drawing boards that butted against each other in the attic of a small space. And we had a ball just creating art, doing design. And he was an illustrator. And some of our early clients, believe it or not, we did we worked for Apple. Uh, we did all the ads for Apple from a New York agency because he was a phenomenal airbrush illustrator pre-Photoshop. Wow. So, and I was working corporate work, doing annual reports and design for companies like Eli Lilly and Dow and things like that. So we had a nice little small boutique and then it, it grew to 50 people. And the transition happened when he, he passed away I'm and sorry. I had all these people and the world just got busier and busier. And I decided that I, I was never home. I had clients in Europe and Hawaii and I was having a lot of fun doing design, mm. but somehow the art was gone away because I was managing people, managing money, managing people. So I slowly began to whittle the thing down until it became just me. And the company is called Patterson Thomas. But when it got down to me, I was doing some work with a client and he loved what I did. And he had a launch party and invited me there. And when I came in, he said, everybody, I would like you to meet the man who did this. He's a real artist. He's a fine artist. He's a designer. He's a painter. He's a branding. Everybody meet my brand artist. And as I tell the story, that was, it was an amazing evening because all these people came up to me and said, 
wow, I love what you did for him. You, you really did a great job with, with rebranding his company. What, tell me what a brand artist does. And that was the question the whole night. What was surprising to me is I had been in business maybe for 15 and 20 years. No one ever asked me, came up and said, tell me about graphic design. Enlighten me about advertising and marketing. And so it was a lesson for me. I changed the name of my company. My real epiphany was that I found that I got more joy out of taking an individual to a new plateau, to helping them find what I call their unique creativity and package that to the world. I had launched Prozac. I was a 3M consultant. None of the executives would run up and hug me and thank me for what I did. You know, they just gave me a check. But when I do it for people, there's a bond that I know I've really done a great thing to help move them forward. And it's just, it was just more rewarding for me. So that's 99% of what I do. I say I help good people do great things. That's, I think, uh, what I feel about your relationship when I met you guys. I love the talent and the spirit that you have. And to me, helping bring that to life, that's, it, it, it's like you training a, a person who wins a gold medal. When I see my clients stop stumbling and start running on a path that I think is right for them and they're happier and life's going to be easier. That, that's that's why, I, why I do all this. That so. is absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. I love that you had the courage to make such a big switch with what you were doing and truly find your passion. And it's clear from listening to you how passionate mm -hmm. you are Still about has to it. Do with art, and it though, yes. Because it's a it, it's an art to coach someone, you know. Mm -hmm. Like I always like for me, when I talk about coaching with people, I always compare coaches with artists. Like in the in one of the episodes I told you that a coach is like a jeweler, you know, mm -hmm. when the jeweler polishes the diamond and makes it very valuable. Or like I tell people like, you know, like you, a coach is like, like a painter, for example, right? When Da Vinci paint Mona Lisa, like that paint the the cloth canvas, the canvas was white, clear, right? He imagined it, and every day he came to that canvas and put a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit. And then he make the paint, right? When Michelangelo, for example, sculpt his sculpture, it was the same way. He took a rock that, if mm -hmm. you look at it, it, looks like nothing, right? And he sculpted, and now those statues go for millions of dollars. Like it's the same thing with the coach. Like it's it's the same concept. You take something that's very raw, not shiny yet, mm -hmm. and you you give it the value. It's just that that person has to be, let's put it this way, sculptable. Yeah, moldable. Yeah, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Because that will happen if Michelangelo's rock will like Michelangelo wants to sculpt here and the rock will crack the other way. You know what I mean? Like the the, the sculpture <laughs> that look good. Right. It's the same thing. That's that's why like when we talk in the past about the connection between coaches and their like in sports is their athletes and life is their uh, students. It's very important for the student to connect with the coach, and I think we connect very well from the beginning. Mm. Thank yes. You. We definitely did. And I love hearing your perspective on how important that human connection is for you. For us as gymnastics coaches, the most rewarding thing is watching your students prevail or progress and just even the littlest bit of progression. It's just a feeling that's unlike anything else um, because you know, how much that it takes from you as a person. Of course, if I created something that I considered to be a masterpiece that was physical, I'd be proud of myself. But mm -hmm. it's different when you're coaching someone else because you're not just proud of yourself, you're proud for them. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I think we connect on as coaches. And that's why like our bond with you is so special because to share that feeling with someone else who knows what that feels like is it's just amazing. We love working with you. We love watching your enthusiasm for what you do. It excites us and motivates us to be better coaches, even though we coach in two different aspects of life. But you see, that's what I think is very important for coaches to have enthusiasm because that's what the, the student or the athlete feeds out. Like if you, if you go in front of someone and you try to teach them, but you are excited from them learning, doesn't matter how hard is that process, doesn't matter how much they stumble and 
how many mistakes they make. If you stay excited and you show them excited, that's excite them to go through it. Like if you take it, I have to say like personal kind of, right? Like they do a mistake and you look at the athlete and you are like in my position as a gymnastic coach, like I look at the athlete and I say, ah, this, this girl, she's not matching my level of coaching, you know what I mean? Because her level of athleticism is not matching my, my mm-hmm. level of coaching. You make her feel incapable of performing well then. You have to be excited for her, not for you first. And that's what you did with us. When we start working in this process to get to where we are today, mm-hmm. you keep us excited about making the changes mm-hmm. to do our, to, to start this project, right? Mm-hmm. If the first conversations we have with you, you look at me and say, oh, this guy doesn't speak English correct. This <laughs> word doesn't come out right. I mean, it make me feel uncomfortable about said. that. <laughs> Things that I'm already uncomfortable about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've talked about how I think a good coach sees beyond the person that is in front of them and yeah. sees the person they could be. And a, a good coach can see it and sense it. I've heard you talk about that, that this this girl has talent. She has what it takes. And she's six years old. I mean, you know, how in the world can you do that? It's like your Michelangelo story. I think the thing was, uh, someone came up and asked, how could he carve David out of a Uh a block of marble? He said it was easy. I just chipped away everything that didn't look like David. He had in his imagination. You have to imagine. It's true, though. You have to imagine the, 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 it's not the product, but it's kind of like that. It's the end product. Like for me, for example, with gymnastics, let's say a girl starts at six years old, right? Around six, five, six years old. Till her first Olympic Games, she has around 10 years to 11 years. Then when you start coaching that little child, you have to picture her years ahead already and see like, okay, does she has the potential to be in this place when she's like 13, 14? She has to be at a level where she's close to the Olympics, right? And she has to show that type of Olympic value. Mm -hmm. And you have to imagine it a little bit and you have to, to work towards creating that imagination. That's why I said it's like an artist. Right. You know, the artist imagine the art. The, it's not like just the art works, walks mm-hmm. in his uh, studio, right? Like when you do a, like when you paint, I don't know how to paint. I would like to, but I never, <laughs> I, like I, actually in school, I never been, they didn't let me go to those type of classes. I had to go back in the gym and train when I have the artistic classes, like music, painting, art. I had to leave the school and I would go back in the gym and train. Then I never did it. Although I like it, I don't have the skill for it. Sometimes I wish they let me do it because I think I would be good well, I have to. I have to correct you. I had a great experience once in Denver, Colorado. Um, I went out there for a while and I bumped into a guy at a gas station. And, and he had paint on. I said, are you an artist? He said, yeah. Why don't you come over? I'm going to have a class tonight. I said, what do you do? He goes, I teach people who say they aren't artists how to be artists. I said, I got to see that. So <laughs> I went out there with him, and his, his name was Ken Olson. And I think Ken has passed away now. But Ken was a very good painter and well-known in art circles. He had a lot of major artists who were his friends. He was the real deal. And I went out there, and he had this room full of people and we all sat in a circle and he said introduce yourself the guy said i'm his mechanic you know i'm his dentist i'm and he had developed this conversation of people about art and they all said i'm not an artist so anyway he took one of them at random says, get up here what can't you do he said i can't even draw a straight line he goes, <laughs> okay. so he, he took a big piece of paper said draw me a straight line and the guy goes, he said, no, draw me a straight line. Draw me a straight line, you dumb skull. Draw me a straight And the guy gets madder and madder. He goes, okay, stop. And he put a yardstick up, perfectly straight line. And he looked at him and he said, now, what else can't you do? And everybody in the class was in awe. And this guy just taught people that you all have creativity in them. And he taught people to draw astounding pictures. And they were all ashamed of their work. It was all, this was clunky, it doesn't look good. He'd go, okay, okay. And he would go back in his library and he'd pull out a picture and the person had drawn something very similar to a Picasso 
You know, wow. the nose wasn't right, the eye wasn't right, but you put them side by side, it looked like Picasso did it. He goes, hmm, this is probably worth $20 million and yours <laughs> is worth. So he, he, he showed the expression, art isn't making a photographic picture. Art is an expression of your mind in your hand. It was one of the most cosmic things. I have to give you one more story of him because I think about him all the time. He, when the class was over, he said, it's time to go get a beer. So the entire class would go to a bar and we'd sit there with him and we'd talk about art. And one girl says, but I just never know what to draw. And he grabbed her hand like this and he froze her arm in front of 20 people. And she was shocked. like he went. But the expression on her hand, uh -huh. he said, draw that. The guy was a genius, <laughs> you know, uh, an everyday genius. So anyway. Yeah, that's that's, a, that, a, say, that's that, an that, expression that. of art, and you are an artist, and you're expressing it through your coaching. But yeah, but that, everybody that's has say, art in their heart, and that's a good coach too. That person knew how to teach people. I, I, I'm a hundred percent sure that if I go to someone who right. would spend time with me, teach me how to paint right. or how to play an instrument, I can learn it. But I didn't do it, you know. Then I don't no. know how to do it, although I like it. Understand? So true. Because look, in America, like I see my, my girls in the gym because I work with girls. They all know how to play an instrument. They all mm -hmm. sing. They know how to paint. Mm -hmm. They know like things that I didn't know as a child because I did just one thing. Understand? Yeah. Like my, their focus for me was just be the best athlete, win gold medals. Mm -hmm. Understand? It was not Wasn't who, diverse. who am I as a person too. Right. right. Understand? That, that part didn't interest them. Right. I, I was like a robot, like a little robot doing things. <laughs> No, that was your training. Your coaching had a different, a different style because you know back in Romania in your day, right? It wasn't about inspiring you and and right. it was about yes. pushing you to perform. Yes, yes, it was coaching more centralized on the coach, I think, than the athlete. Yes. And the coach's pride came directly out of mm -hmm. the material success of the athlete, the medal that was earned. Yes that's how they base their success. It was like a selfish victory, I guess. And I think that's really? where you have to steer away from as a coach. You always have to stay excited for mm -hmm. your student, whatever capacity you coach them in. And you have to realize that their victory is theirs at that time. Yes. And that's what you have to keep in your heart when and you're you have to them. you have to help them if they they do mistakes. That's the only right. thing. But you see, like, I have to go back a little bit to coaching in Romania. How was? It's true. They was, how to say it correctly, like everything that mattered was how good you can be as an athlete, how much you can win, right? Because that was the value that the coach had. It was not even about you. It was about the coach or the club being the best. Right. Because you won. Understand? then right. your personality didn't matter. It's exactly like I said, you was like a little robot, like like little soldiers. You just go there and you take orders and you do what you have to do and that's it, you know. Right. But it's, Well, it's, didn't you say that you were you were selected as a child yes, to be a gymnast yes, and yes. then they take you away from your home and you go live yes. in these it's, it's, It was different, like not just in gymnastics. Like in, I think in all the, all the sports was like that. The coaches, they mm -hmm. will go to the school. I told you when the school starts in September, they will go to the school and they will pick up wow. the athletes and they will put you in whatever sport they decide you're going to do. That was right. the majority. It was very rare for someone to just show up and be like, I want to do this sport. Because even if you show up and you say, for example, I was going to go to play basketball. I like basketball, right? I would be like, okay, I want to play basketball. They will look at my parents when I go to the basketball gym. And my father is like five foot two. My mother is four <laughs> ten. Not going to happen. Like, no, it's not going to happen. Like take him to gymnastics or wrestling and, you know, like sports where I could use my physicality based on my genetics. Understand? Yeah. But... Also, they will not have the the emotional part that much. Understand? They will not develop you as a person. Right. You you was just an athlete. You you was just a machine to win. Understand? Right. If, if I have a broken the... leg and they they will put me to compete, like if I broke, I, I compete with broken fingers, broken foot, like wow. uh, you know. I, I had to. was to win medals for the state. 
Yes, you have right. to win. That was the only thing. You had to win. And when you make it up to the highest level, like the national team, like oh, you, you had to win. Like I remember when in 2008, we was watching the Olympics in uh, Beijing in China. Mm-hmm. And when they start the opening ceremony, I told him like the, the Chinese athletes, they have to win, like especially in gymnastics, they have to win. They have no other option. They don't win. They get punished. Like it's not like they go back home and they're going to be fine. No, the government is going to go after them. Mm. In this country, that's how sports are. Wow. You know, they are very politicized. Those athletes in those countries, like today, like Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, the athletes are the, the pride of the country. Understand? They are used as um, political pawns. Mm. Sure, I know. And then it's different pressure in being an athlete in this type of environment. But you see, like when I look back in Romania, yes, I can talk a lot about coaching and how bad they they were behavior-wise. I can say mm-hmm. right. But also, the system was the way it was. You know, I, like I can say stories about my first coach, for example, that things that he did wrong. But he did a lot of good things too. Mm-hmm. Do I believe that down like to his heart he is a bad person? No, I like I like him. I love that man. Like he gives me what I have today. I learn from him. You know what I mean? Right. He didn't know how to be different because everybody around him was right. the same way. Well, this, that was just how they taught. You told me how you know you see the flaws in that coaching style, but they made you great, and you you respect them and you love them for for what they yes. did, but you wish they had been, they had Different. been coached to do it differently. Yes. yes. You know, you kind of, you become what the system is around you, you know. Right. That's why, like, I get, like, I'm being honest, like, I get, I get more upset when they see coaches in USA behaving incorrectly with mm-hmm. athletes than if you tell me that someone from China did something, I don't know, say something to an athlete or, like, did something wrong to an athlete. It's a little bit, different because there the society is the way it is then right. they're not they're gonna do what they they told to do most of the time well i think the mistakes that you see in other places come out of being a product of their environment like you're saying mm-hmm. it's what they've learned to do and how they've learned to teach whereas here the problems that occur are more out of personal ego or frustration yeah. Mm. or failing to do things passionately like you both were just talking about you see it in the end of the day when you're only focused on the product and you're not focused on the process and you're not caring about Mm. how the student that you're coaching is feeling and how their journey is going as a whole and it becomes more of an outcome rather than enjoying what you're doing. You can tell when someone doesn't do something passionately. And that's when I think problems start to occur in the coaching world. I think coaching is changing as society moves forward. Here in America, uh, the young people coming up, they have a different attitude about life. Uh, I grew up in the the baby boomer. It was a World War II generation. There was an attitude. There was a thankfulness about having a job. There was patriotism. There was happy to just have a home and a family and someone not trying to kill you. And, and today, like, the youth are growing up with such an amazing technological background. They can watch any TV show they want, anything on their phones. They have a million, 10 million songs or whatever to listen to any time they want. So they move and change, and their whole world is different. So coaching a person like that, you have to motivate and inspire them or they'll just walk out the door. They, just, they won't tolerate. They have a uh, lot of opportunities. Right. And they especially have to in America. America. That's what, yeah. I think that's why your illuminating champions idea is so strong is you try and find that in them and illuminate it first to them. And you see, for me, I didn't have opportunities. They give me though, like doing gymnastics was a give it opportunities to me to be something more than my parents. Understand? Mm-hmm. Like I could go to a school, I could finish. Like, for example, my father has eight grades. My mother has four grades. Mm. I'm the first one in my family to finish a high school and then get a degree mm. out of high school, like a college degree, right, mm-hmm. to coach, right? The first one, and we talk about the 2000s. We don't talk about the 1960 in America. 
Understand? My father grew up to the Russian invasion after the World War II. Then by the time he was 12, he had to work on the railroad, like building railroads. Like it, it was different life. Mm-hmm. Then for me, being in a sport and everybody like me at the time in my country, mm-hmm. that was an opportunity. They and they make you feel that. Like you you feel that. They will let you know that that's mm-hmm. an opportunity for you. Because I will go to the gym after school and my coach will wait for me with a chicken sandwich and give me to eat that. And I'll be like, you see, I gave you food because we didn't have food. And wow. they'll remember me like, you see, you want to eat this chicken sandwich, you have to train. Then it didn't matter that they slap me, beat me, yell at me, swear at me. I had to do because I want to eat. Mm-hmm. Or they will give me a chicken to bring it home to my family. Then my family had like, it's, it's different, but was the society was like that. Well, I think though, we have to keep part of that. We have to remind our students that what they're doing is an opportunity. Of course, it's not so drastic yes. now, yeah, but, but they see, do need to view that's that what I was as learning. an like, opportunity. For me, it was just the opportunity they give me. Where in America, it's they have an opportunity. When a it's child many. does a sport, yeah. a child does study something like music or whatever it is, painting, math, like geography, they want to be good at it. They have an opportunity on that field. Mm-hmm. but they don't own the opportunity. So most of your students, it sounds like gymnastics is just one of the many things they do Yes. to For become a them, better yeah. person. Yes. Yeah. Well, like, look, made- she knows how to play piano professional. I love <laughs> piano. <that> anymore. <laughs> she lo- like, I-, I will never picture myself like how, how, mm. who will put me in a piano class? Like, I will never have that opportunity. That, that was not even in the plate for me to do something like that. Mm-hmm. And I come to America and she's like, she's playing piano. She knows how to sing. How you call that instrument that you play? The, the flute. The flute. Like, <laughs> I never, I never saw a flute like in real life. Like, you know, you I mean? just didn't have the opportunities. But, no. Correct. But what I like about what, you know, what we've talked about is, you know, knowing that your students have all these opportunities and knowing that, only a sliver of them will ever take gymna- gymnastics to the highest level or even compete at the Olympics. What you do is you just make sure that they know that you love them, that you know that you're trying to help them be better, and you're teaching them life skills of yes. perseverance and determination and pride. And I, and I think that's what... Uh, but that's, that's what, what I told you in the like, past. The most important is to be champion in life. You understand? Athletics, it's very important too, right? If, if you take athletics professionally yeah. right let's say you come to gymnastics side see your daughter and I, I tell you as a parent like look she has potential she's talented she she had the whole package right because it's not just talent right the work ethic is more important than talent the natural mm-hmm. talent mm-hmm. like then you decide as a parent because the child is young it's six years old five years old seven years old you decide like okay i want to give her this her this opportunity then i'm gonna push her career right mm-hmm but she may do it, she may not do it. She may get to like, it's, it's, a, it's a long road. You have to understand that. Mm-hmm. Then you have to teach her to have skills for real life because her athletic career is going to come to an end at one point. Can mm-hmm. come to an end after she wins three, four, five Olympic Games mm-hmm. or can come to an end three years into her career to go to the Olympics because God forbid and she has an accident or she just doesn't like it anymore. Right. I understand because she grows up, she turns 12 or 13, and she mm-hmm. decides that, look, mom, you know, I like gymnastics, but I like to play piano more than gymnastics. Mm-hmm. Now she has the skills from gymnastics to have that discipline to go to study piano and be good at that. Mm-hmm. Or she wants to study to go to school for, I don't know, medical school, and then she has to put more time into academics. Then she's going to carry that discipline from sport into real life. And that's why sports are important for young kids to sure. teach them discipline, mm-hmm. understand? Because that's what makes us successful. That's what makes us good adults is having good discipline because the good discipline gives us the good work ethic. Then we're capable to work hard. We're capable to go through hard things and stand up and try again and make the adjustments. We don't give up. Discipline doesn't let you give up. So so what, you, what makes a good coach? Like you're talking, you, you know, you said you can see when America, coaches are doing bad coaching what in your estimation just so it's clear for your listeners what makes a good coach a good coach Mm -hmm. a good coach is someone who 
first of all, like I said in the past, coach without ego. His ego has to stay out of coaching a student. Mm. Understand? A good coach is someone who's able, capable to see what is invisible. Because mm-hmm. sometimes you look at, at someone, not just sports, arts, uh, academics. Look at Einstein. He didn't look that smart in high school, <laughs> right? If you go to his math teachers in high school and middle school and the guy was like failing classes, you're not going to think that he's going to become the biggest genius in the world, right? Mm-hmm. But that's the, that's the best ability of a coach is to see, is to see the diamond in the raw rock. Understand? Yeah. That's the good quality. I said to see correct? the potential. Yes. That's unseen to the untrained eye. Yes, because look, you're not going to get it like in gymnastics. Like I hear, this is something that I hear a lot when I go to competitions and talk to coaches. Like, oh, I, did, I didn't make a champion because I didn't have a Simone Biles or Ali Reisman walking in my gym. Mm-hmm. Nor their coaches. They make them, <laughs> understand? Like, right. it's not like Ali Reisman walking Mihai Brestiano's gym and it's like, hey, Mr. Mihai Brestiano, can you take me to the Olympics? In 2012, London, I'm going to win floor, gold on floor. Like, right. just take me there, please. No. Right. That guy took her, worked with her, struggled. Right. She struggled. He struggled. They go back and mm-hmm. forth in training. Like, he changed training programs. He, he did everything possible and took out of her that Olympic champion. The same thing with Simone Biles' first coach. That lady did a very good job with her. You know, like, make Simone Biles who Simone Biles is today. She yeah. saw in that little girl mm-hmm. that was jumping up and down, right? She saw the value and she like took all that energy and ch- channeled, channeled, channeled it correctly, you know. It's, it's important for a coach to have that uh, Michelangelo talent. Right. He a great coach has, has to see that talent yes. and pull it out. But yes, a great coach also has to have great, talented students to walk in the gym or they'll, you know, it doesn't, the magic doesn't happen. I think you need to have students that are moldable, as he said, they're not always the most talented, but they have to be Mm -hmm. willing to be receptive to what you're saying. And you have to be able to work together. And then, you know, two things that you just brought up or you have to be creative and you can't be afraid to create because Mm -hmm. the child is your blank canvas. And you have to trust that image that you foresee for them. And that's scary, especially if you're a new coach. You can look at them and say, oh, I think she's capable of doing this. Mm -hmm. And then second guess yourself, like, well, what if it doesn't happen? Or what if she doesn't get there? Coaches have the same type of anxiety that athletes get. Yeah, but we you just don't, show don't always it. show it or we you, don't no, talk you can't, about it. You, you can't, can't show, show it cannot, to the you. child. I'm saying within yourself, even it's never discussed though, I think between mm-hmm. people, but you have to trust yourself yeah. and you need to trust the plan that you formulate in your head. And the other thing is you need to know that your time with them is temporary. Yes. That's what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. So when they're in your presence, you do need to be cognizant of the fact that it is not forever, even if you would love it. If it was, it's not. So you need to make the mm-hmm. most lasting impression that you can make on them within whatever it is that you're teaching them and beyond in life. So. And you say like, your, I think your passion has to be humble. Mm-hmm. I understand because look, one mm-hmm. thing, same thing, like people tell me all the time because I'm very passionate, right? And I, if I get a girl like, I had one time a girl and she was very good. And I was like, okay, this kid can go to the Olympics. And everyone's like, how do you know that? She may quit. I mean, maybe her parents do This is not Romania. Maybe her parents are not going to want to do gymnastics. Mm-hmm. And I said, yes, mm-hmm. I know that. And I knew that, right? But I'm not going to coach someone based on the fact that may, they may quit because that's like a, you are a neurosurgeon and someone comes to you with a brain tumor, right? And you are like, you know what? It's a bad one. They may die anyways. I'm not going to do the surgery good. Understand? I'm not going to do my best surgery because there's no point. The the tumor is too big. It's too Mm. late. You know? No. That's when you're going to try the best, right? Because if I can save you from that tumor, I'm a good surgeon. The same thing with the coach. If when everybody doubts you, I can make you the best, Mm -hmm. I'm a good coach. 
understand? Then I'm not going to coach based on the fact that, yeah, you may quit. Yeah, you things may happen like the, but that's not in my head. In my head is just how I can make you the best possible mm-hmm. you can be. How I can take that diamond out of you. Do you say those things to the students or do you just say it through your coaching methods? I tell them all the time those things. You say I, those words. You say those words. The too. exact words. Yeah, I tell the That's I tell crazy. the girls and I tell the parents when that I talk. I talk a lot now <laughs> because I learn English. <laughs> when I come to America, I was very quiet. Parents will come to me, will try to have a conversation, and I'll be just like, "Hello, how are you?" and go away. <laughs> then after I met her, like she taught me English, she helped me with my English, and now my English is good. I practice with everybody. That's what I tell them, and I go and I just talk. No, mm-hmm. no, I like I talk and I'm, I'm very honest look whatever like people that watch this video and they know me and they talk to me they're going to look at it and be like yeah he told us that right. like I'm very honest like I'm not a guy that I'm not going to go around and just make things up like when I talk now I talk from my heart I don't talk to mm-hmm. look good on camera right. I don't need that well I you have an authenticity <laughs> and a sincerity yes. that uh, I'm sure and I think honesty honesty is the more the most important because Honesty always comes out. Understand? Like if you try to create yourself a fake person, even as a coach, mm-hmm. at one point your real mm-hmm. personality is going to come out. Yeah. Understand? Because as a coach, for example, you have a lot of stressful situations. Understand? And then if you're not you the way you are, at one point your real you is going to... Understand? If you are not a nice person, at one point you're gonna you yeah, show it. you're gonna show yeah. it. Understand? Mm-hmm. There's no way you're not going right. to because right. athletes, especially in gymnastics, you're gonna get slapped by an athlete. They're gonna elbow like <laughs> like for me. I get elbow in the face. I get slapped. I get kicked when I spot. You know, what I mean, they let go of the bar. You have to catch them. Your heart jumps out of your chest. You know, you almost have a heart mm-hmm. attack. Like you're gonna have a reaction that's not mm-hmm. controllable if mm-hmm. you're not a nice person then it's better for you to be honest. And if you don't feel like you're capable to coach with honesty right. and with good heart, don't do it. And with patience. Yeah. Yes. You have patience. to be patient. Have to have, I saw at least that in the beginning of their career, they were not, they were not that good. You look at them, it's like, oh, I don't know if they're going to make it. And then once of a sudden, they go to world championships and European games and Olympic games and win medals. And you're like, whoa. Because they're persistent. You know, they have that discipline. They train hard. They work, they work, they work, and they got better. And then the one that was the super talent one that you can see from the beginning looks like a diamond. You're right. They just like fade down because they didn't have the work ethic. Work mm-hmm. ethic and perseverance will will trump you know, raw, raw talent all the time if yes. the raw yeah. talent does not have that. Look at the Olympics champions in all the sports. The majority of them are not the most talented athletes. They mm-hmm. are talented enough to be there, but their work ethic is what makes them Olympic champions. Right. Right. Now, look at all the world champions in even professional sports, not just Olympic sports. Now, right. If you listen to their stories, it mm-hmm. always has to do with work ethic and discipline and wanted to be the best. Yeah. You know, it's never someone who's going to come over and be like, you, you know, know, I just, I don't know, I wake up and I become Olympic champion. I, I want to do my best and that was fine. No, they, they, they are very driven. Driven. Driven people. That's why so they you- are successful. So, so do you think that all of your students feel that they are champions or champions in the making? I hope so, because that's what I let them feel. I tell them they are champions. That's the goal. (laughs) Sometimes they walk in not realizing that yet. I shouldn't say sometimes. They do walk in not realizing that. They Mm -hmm. aspire to be that, but they do normally equate that to attaining Mm -hmm. a gold medal. Yeah, and, coach, a good coach, a real, real coach, an honest coach. You coach all the levels. Like my kids now in my gym, I have pretty, let's say, lower levels coaching, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But they are the most competitive in that level. When I go with them to competition, I have the same passion for them. Like I had when I coach, for example, Diana Bulimar from Romania, when we used to go to international competitions and win five gold medals out of five, mm. you know, and the whole arena was like, how that happened, you know? I have the same passion. That doesn't change. It's right. just the level of execution that changed. Right. But Your my desire to change as no. a coach, depending mm-hmm. on the level of the student. Or the Great ability topic. of the student. You don't change your right. passion based on that. You look at it it's like, ah, oh, this one. Right. Like, whatever. Like, just go do your... She competes, I don't know, in gymnastics. She competes right. Excel bronze. Just let her... No. Right. I want to make her the best. 
can I bring that Excel bronze girl to like, I don't know, the highest levels in Excel, like and be the national champion? That's what I want. Well, I think that in order to teach your athletes to value themselves, you have to value all of them. Yeah. You can't pick and choose who's valuable based upon mm -hmm. their overall potential or the point that they're at right then in their career. They're mm -hmm. all equally as valuable to you. And you have to feel that and you have to mean it. And right. if you're incapable of doing that, it's going to show and you're never going to get where you where yeah. you want to be because it's not authentic. It's not genuine. For example, my guys in the gym, I always tell them when I coach them, I'm like, you doing gymnastics and become an elite gymnast or going to the Olympics or not doing it is not going to change how I like you. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. only thing that's going to change how I like you is you being disrespectful with me. Mm -hmm. Your behavior is going to change that. But you not going to the Olympics or you doing gymnastics, want to do gymnastics just, I don't know, for mm -hmm. fun, that doesn't change. Right. It's just changing the level of gymnastics that I'm going to teach you and the intensity of the training because obviously you want to be an elite gymnast is a different training because right. you want to achieve something that's very hard. Right. Let's put it that way. And then, but you want to do gymnastics a little bit more for fun. It's just a different approach in training. But my desire to teach you and gives you the give you the skills to be a champion are the same mm -hmm. i'm teaching the girl that compete the lower level to desire to be the best as i teach the girl that's going to maybe go to the olympics one day mm -hmm. mentality wise psychological wise i make mm -hmm. all of them as competitive psychologically mm -hmm. i teach them to be as competitive the only things that is different is the gymnastic skill but that's that's mm -hmm. true and that's the all. other thing that you do that I think that's important that every coach has to remember to do is treat every student like an individual. Yes. Obviously, you're going to use similar methods between each student, just like if you were painting, you use similar technique for different subjects. But every child is different and you need to be able to look at them and see what they truly need in that moment. A lot of times you have to be creative with even how you say things. Sometimes you can tell them the same correction 12 times one way and they're not getting it and everybody else is getting it. And you change the sentence around just by two words and all of a sudden it clicks. And you need to do that as a coach. You need to be cognizant of that. They do learn in different ways and they learn at different paces. And you, you have to notice how they're feeling all the time. You have to see what they're grasping all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that are non-physical things and that are invisible. Things. And you have to make them feel comfortable to strive mm -hmm. for the best and make mistakes, not succeed. Right. Right. Understand, but the pressure of just being successful is damaging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Understand, that's what makes you quit. That's what makes you sure. give up. That's what brings that heaviness mm -hmm. in your heart, you know, to, to be in a sport. Just be successful. No, mm -hmm. I want you to be successful, but guess what? It's okay that I will go to this competition and you did wrong. Right. Like, you know, I, I, I have a girl that was like very good and everybody will go to competition. Everybody will come around to watch her, right? And she'll go there and she'll, she'll be emotional, right? And she'll mess up her routines and I'll always be like, it's fine, let's go. She'll get more upset. I will have to teach her <laughs> to, mm. to cool off, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. To have fun, not like winning because she'll get mad that she didn't win. I'm like, oh, it's fine because competing is also a training. You learn how to compete. You learn it's, it's okay. a process, right? You have to learn how to control your emotion during that stressful event of competing. Right. So, so yeah. coaching starts with the coach being really good at a very specific skill or sport or training. You have to have that or you can never be a great coach. But then it goes into all these other areas, uh, listening to the, to the student. Um, psychological areas. Psychological and dealing with them when they have a bad day and, yes. and when, they're, when they feel hurt and low self-esteem. What I do... When I, when I had my Patterson Thomas ad agency, we were just a creative thing. We took money to do jobs. But as mm -hmm. the brand artist, I really, really, really take on the clients that I want to work with. And I teach them how to be a brand, to own their uniqueness, the strengths. The, you know, they don't have to be like anybody else because they're a one of a kind. And then the artist, people say, well, I'm not an artist. Everybody, every human is an imaginative, creative, thinking person. Oh, every yes. human can write poetry. Can, can write a song, can play a piano. 
maybe not as good as the, the concert pianist or the world famous artist, but they can be fantastically creative being them. And I see that's what you do. You you make sure every kid is a champion. And I, yeah. I think that's an astounding life work for you. And I'm very honest with my kids and their parents too. Like I always tell them like, listen, I don't have the most, when I go to a competition, I don't have the most talented kids in the arena. I have the most competitive. That's great. That's because great. they work correct. <laughs> they win because they know they train correctly. I look at kids that are more talented than my kids. My kids should not win in front of them. And those kids should not be in that level competing against my kids. But my kids are winning because they are training correct. They have a correct mindset, you know. That's great. And it's the same thing that Mark is discussing. You're teaching them to own their uniqueness. Yes. And own like their he own taught potential, me to do that. Just right? like he's doing with us. So yeah. we have to say a big thank you for that, yes. Mark. And we loved hearing about your philosophies of coaching. And we feel so blessed yeah. to share yeah. this whole coaching and learning experience with you. So thank you once again. And we hope that all of our listeners enjoyed learning a little bit more about Mark. And they're going to learn more about him. And gonna, you're going to only gonna learn more <laughs> and learn more into our insights on coaching and athletes. And I think parents. it's going to take us a little bit longer till like we're going to have Mark letting us just fly by ourselves. We're still going to need him. for <laughs> great. I'm, I'm enjoying watching. But no, you, you are a great, you are a great coach in what you do. I'm being honest. I'm not just saying it for people to, to, I don't know, to like you. No, no like it's, it's true. Wonderful. Like, well, you, remember your promise, you know, we're going to go to the Olympics. We're going to go uh, to yeah, the Olympics. Yeah, you're coming. <laughs> like, <laughs> like you see, like that's my biggest dream. I'm going to be honest. I want to make an Olympic champion yeah. for America. And my biggest dream was to be 2028, but that's a little bit uh, out of my control now. I think I'm positive you'll get there. Uh, and I'm One I'm day, ready. listen, when you don't give up, one day, yes. Yeah. Right. And... We're gonna we're gonna laugh about those discussions then. People are gonna remember it's like, oh those guys predicted pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much thank for joining you, us again, Mark, and thank, thank you, you for sharing with everyone your passion. We hope all coaches of different styles, of different teaching methods yes. are inspired listening to what you do. And they can also like approach you because you can teach them yes. how to be yeah. very good person you know i mean and very good at what they are doing and how to bring out the artists we want to grow your coaching business and take it to other cities because you've got a lot to offer you have have a a lot to offer thank you the same to you thank you thank Thank you you everybody for listening Thank thank you everybody thank you for listening to illuminating champions don't forget to subscribe to our channel and stay tuned for our next episode